Hello, everybody, and welcome to Arkansas Alive. I really appreciate you watching each day. And uh, I believe the Holy Spirit's going to minister to you today about the key of David in our final conclusion. And I want you to listen very carefully to the Holy Spirit. Stay tuned. Arkansas Alive starts right now. You know, we started this series uh, by reading um, out of Revelation 3 and verse 7. And Jesus is writing to the churches in Asia, and he addresses each one of them individually. And the church in Philadelphia, the church that was actually in revival, if you please, uh, Jesus said, he that is holy and he that is true, talk about himself, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, shutteth and no man openeth. There was a divine connection between David and Jesus. Jesus was of the lineage of David. You'll hear him referred to as the root of the offspring of Jesse, the root of David, the son of David. Jesus was out of that Davidic lineage. David will rule as king of Jerusalem during the millennium from Jerusalem. He's buried there. Jesus is the king of kings, and he will rule the world. But there was a connection between the two. And that fascinated me when I read that about the key of David. What was the key of David? Not going into the historical background and all the lineage and everything. David was a scoundrel in many ways, but yet the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. What, what made him that way? What, what does that mean to be a man after God's own, uh, God's own heart? And the companion scripture to this, the key represents power and authority to rule and reign. Uh, in uh, Matthew 16, Jesus told Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, I'm going to give you the key, keys of the kingdom from the heavens. Uh, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So he gives this authority, this assignment of, uh, power to rule to the church. The church is to be ruling and reigning in the earth today. Now, I'm not talking about kingdom now teaching. That's erroneous, the way it's being taught. Yes, we should be involved in our culture. Yes, we should be involved in every aspect of our culture. But the error in kingdom now teaching today, as it's been taught, and it's not new. Hilton Sutton called our attention to it 30 years ago. The kingdom now teaching that is erroneous is that we, the church company, are going to take over every aspect of society and culture, and we are going to establish the kingdom, and then Jesus will return. Not so. Jesus, the Bible says, will set up his own kingdom. You know, you may be hearing even from the 700 Club News and from CBN News that there is a, a movement now to establish the red heifers that will be required for the sacrifices for the second temple. And even the Jews in Jerusalem and Israel are, how would I say, um, not in agreement uh, uh, as to whether the uh, temple has to be built before Jesus comes back. Of course, they're looking for Messiah's first coming. Church is looking for his second coming. There is a, a difference of opinion as to whether the, the temple has to be built before Jesus comes back and that he will only return the second time if the temple is ready and they will start the offering of the red heifer again, the priest's service, whatever. And then there's the opinion that Jesus will come back and he will build the temple. So there's two different opinions, even among the Jews, even among the rabbis. 
Well, there's, uh, I say, difference of opinions on a lot of doctrines. But according to the scripture, that's what we stick with. There's no evidence that the church company was to take over the world, change the culture, and then Jesus would return. Okay, Jesus, we've got everything under control now. We've taken over. Now you can return. Not, you won't find that uh, attitude and that doctrine in the scripture. The church company has one assignment, to preach the gospel to the world and make disciples, to be a witness. That's our assignment. Always has been. Now I'm talking about the church. Always has been our assignment. Always will be our assignment. So anything that distracts us from that or takes us away from that is going to prevent us from fulfilling our assignment. Now, Jesus wrote the churches in Asia. He commended them for what they did right. He rebuked them for what they did wrong. And he wrote the church at Ephesus and told them all the good things they had done. But he said, I have someone against you. There's something that's bothering me here. And it's that you have left your first love. Now, what did we say yesterday? Interpret that. Modernize it. Interpret it. You have left your love, the first one. Didn't say you lost it. Said you left it. You left your love, the first one. The first love that you had for Jesus when you first got saved. That's what I dealt with mostly yesterday. What was the key of David? The key of David was he was a man after God's own heart. He had been given the power and authority to rule and reign. But his key was that he was a worshiper and that he was a man after God's own heart. The key to molding that, melding that into the church company in Revelation is that we have left our first love. Our love, the first one that we had for Jesus, has waned. And Jesus addressed this. He said, remember, uh, therefore, from whence you are fallen, and repent and do the first work. So what that tells us is that it, this is not the end. It's not over for us. The church has gotten off many times. It, he said, all you have to do is repent. And no man can do this. You can't fast long enough and pray long enough to cause revival. It's, I, I, you're not going to make God do something by your performance. You get back to your first love, your love, the first one that you had for Jesus when you first got saved. Now, we're going to talk about how to do that. If you'll repent and do the first works, for if you don't, I will come and remove the candlestick out of its place, except you repent. So here we are. We're at the end. The key of David, man after God's own heart. Your love, your first one. After 30 years, Ephesus had repented. Now, we, we have to take, let me see, I wrote this down. We have to take Ignatius' word for it. Ignatius was a church historian. He was a um, professional. He was, his works were not canonized, but he was kind of a reporter, and he would keep people abreast of things. By the time John, the Apostle John, had seen the exalted Christ on Patmos, remember he spent 30 years on, uh, I, I'm sorry, a year and a half, maybe 18 months on Patmos, and then he went back and fulfilled the commission Jesus gave, us, gave him on the cross, which was to go take care of his mother, and he did. They lived in Ephesus, attended the church at Ephesus until she died, and then he died, approximately 100 years of age for both of them. Uh, 30 years had passed since the Ephesians repented. They did repent. Ignatius reports that. After fighting spiritual battles, standing against spiritual wolves from without and 
deserters from within. They had become so focused on protecting their church, they left their first love, which was intimacy with Jesus. And that's what you see when you see on CBN News 700 Club. You see these little pockets of revival around the country now. You see young people. They're just so in love with Jesus. They're just standing and worshiping and loving him. That, that's, that's what this is, intimacy with Jesus. They're not so concerned with structure. They don't know much about doctrine or faith or anything like that. They just know they love Jesus. <laughs> and they made a movie about it called The Jesus Generation. Well, we were pastoring our first church when that happened in the early 70s. And those young people came to our church. And you might say they were Jesus hippies, but they loved Jesus. I mean, they didn't, they weren't workers in the church. They didn't get involved or start anything. They were just passing through. They were just floating, following the Holy Ghost. But they were a wake-up call that you cannot leave your first love. You're, you're to stay innocent, tender, beloved. Okay. The blazing fire that once characterized the church, Ephesus, had waned. This often happens when the, listen to this now, when the first generation Christians experience a move of God or build a work, but the next generation does not experience the same thing. Whew. Personal word, if you can receive it. Back in the 70s, there was also a movement called the Militant Church. And they were also called or referred to themselves as the Joshua Generation. In other words, it was, get out of my way. It's my turn. We don't want to go back to where you came from. We're going to start everything all new. And there were different and various versions of that the visitor-friendly, seeker-friendly, they took the cross down, they got rid of the choir ribs in the choir, they put up a rock band. Uh, they were trying to relate to the culture and thinking that they would become like the culture and the culture would want to come to that church. It failed miserably. The founder of it, Bill Hybels, even wrote a, you know, a general public letter saying we failed to make disciples, we've just created carnal Christians. Well, the remnants of that are still around. But if you don't keep, and, and it's not nostalgia, it's not the old way, it's not your parents' way, it's not traditional church denomination. There were a lot of things that were thrown out with the bathwater. That's, that's kind of like spiritual cancel culture. We don't want anything to do with your generation. We've got our own generation. We're going to do it our way. Okay. <laughs> but we had the anointing and the power of God like no other generation had. The 40s and 50s healing revivals, the charismatic renewal went all over the world. And it, when you cannot bring the next generation along with you, and of course, it's really up to them because they either follow or not. And many of them that I've seen, there's some that do want to follow. They do want to know. I ministered in a church in Canada a few years ago where they asked me if I would stay around and just after the service, and they'd invited all the pastors in the area uh, to kind of hear uh, from me and listen to what I had to offer. I'm speaking uh, uh, next week or so in a, or next month or so in this course time you see this it'll be closer to a ministerial uh, convention where that's exactly what they asked me to do they want me to come and share things that they are they're not sure of they don't know what they're doing they're faltering they're uh, falling out there they're <clears throat> getting weak and sick and burning out and they and they need some advice on what to do and I thought well praise God at least they want to know I was invited by a group of young pastors to Oklahoma City one time and it was called an idea exchange and they sat around the table and they wanted to hear from my generation. I was the only one there from my generation. I was old enough to be all of them's father and they wanted to hear from, from that generation because they had a plan 
and and it was a good plan and they were commended to be you know where they were spiritually and reaching their cities but they wanted to hear from the next uh, the previous generation well that's a good thing that's a biblical thing if you don't want to hear from the previous generation and you're not willing to take advice then you're going to miss the mark you're going to go right past you're just going to be out there all by yourself someday usually it's pride I want to make my mark. I don't need you. I don't want you. I want to do it my way. I want to do this and blah, blah, blah. So, unfortunately, the next generation does not experience the same thing as the previous generation. And this can happen to any church unless each church member becomes unrelenting to their commitment, to their passion for Jesus. And here are the scriptures, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. Remember, Jesus said, Remember from whence you have fallen. Remember whence you have fallen. So you have to remember. You have to go back and you have to analyze. Okay, where, where did we miss it? Where did we make a wrong turn? Have you ever been lost? And you wonder, okay, uh, where did I miss it? Where did I take the wrong turn? Well, this is what you do in self-evaluation. Where did I miss it? And this doesn't just have to apply to the church. It can reply, uh, apply to your personal life, ministry, your family, whatever, your business, whatever you believe in God for, whatever God called you to do. Um, and, and just, just go, to, go down the list here. Think about what changed. Uh, what changed? was the beginning step of leaving your first love. I have a list here. Are you receptive to the power of God and the gifts of the Spirit or not? Well, we used to be at one time, but we don't see the benefit of it anymore. Then, then you have fallen. You have, you're, you're digressing. Um, the, the church at Ephesus loved Jesus' name. Now, this is how they repented and got back on track. They loved Jesus' name. Uh, do you still hear messages on the power of the name of Jesus? Do you hear messages on the blood covenant, on the blood of Jesus? Do you hear messages on how to live a holy life? Do you hear messages on how to raise a godly family, have a godly marriage? Uh, do you hear messages on uh, how to uh, improve yourself and do the things that you know you should do? Do you have a, a, hear a message on the forgiveness of sin, how to repent? Well, the church at Ephesus loved Jesus' name, and they were quick to confess sin. What is sin? When was the last time you heard a message on what sin was. I don't mean your great doctrinal sermon. You know, I'm just talking about following the scriptures. Uh, 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 Ephesus severed their connections with the past. Did you hear that? They severed their connection with the past. Uh, next, they were publicly persecuted. They were publicly persecuted. I remember when we first started our church, we, heard, we had quite a few, I say quite a few, we had a few uh, criticisms, people that were bad-mouthing us. It, it, it was simply because we were the new kid on the block and we were having revival. We were having salvations and healings and deliverances and uh, Pentecost uh, services. Uh, publicly persecuted, faith-filled. Are you still faith-filled or you have pushed faith to the back seat and you're doing other things? You know, oh, well, the faith message is over. No, <laughs> the faith message is never over because faith is never over. Uh, are you letting, uh, are you throwing out the baby with the bathwater? Are you letting people that have made shipwreck of their life or their ministry, made fools of themselves? Are you letting them uh, determine 
how you uh, pursue Christ and how you preach and how your services are. I know we had a lady in our church one time because our church was not Pentecostal by name or denomination, but it was Pentecostal by experience, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. And we always had the gifts of the Spirit and still do. But there was this one lady that, that came to us one time and you could tell, I mean, she was a, if you ever can imagine what this term means, she was a sour puss. In other words, she'd come in the service and she'd just sit there and look. And you know she wasn't participating. And the gifts of the Spirit operate. Well, she told us one day after service, she said, you know, if you all would tone down the moving of the Spirit, I would bring my friends. <laughs> But my friends don't like all of this emotion and gifts of the Spirit and tongues interpretation. If you would tone that down, I'd bring my friends. And I thought to myself, who needs your friends? I'm not going to run the Holy Spirit out just so your friends will come. They're not going to like what's here either. But here's what we were known for. The love of the brethren. A new commandment I give unto you that you, <laughs> that you love one another as I've loved you. And that's what most people came for, was the love. They sensed it. They knew it, especially people that had been mistreated by other churches or been racially discriminated against. They were accepted. They sensed and felt the love, the first love we had not left. Ephesians, uh, the church in Ephesus, had to repent and go back or else Jesus said, I will come quickly and remove your candlestick. Now, we got about five minutes left. Listen to this. God had an assignment for the church at Ephesus. If you leave your first love and you leave your assignment and he moves your candlestick, what does that mean? It means that your influence will be removed and transferred somewhere else. God gave us favor. He gave us influence into our city, our state, our nation. He will take your influence and be, and it will be removed and transferred somewhere else. Wow. God had an assignment for the church at Ephesus. Now here's Ignatius. In approximately 108 A.D., after the 100 years after the death of Christ, Ignatius reports, Ignatius reports that the church at Ephesus did heed Jesus' warning. And he was there to report this. And he uh, noticed that Jesus' warning was heeded. And they retained their leadership role in Asia for two to three hundred more years. Oh, that blesses me so much. They didn't lose their candlestick. The church at Ephesus regained their influence and their leadership role in Asia. And that's where all the other churches came from. They started the other churches in Thyatira and, and uh, all the other churches were, were out of uh, Ephesus. Jesus wanted the church of Ephesus to continue as the primary candlestick in the region. However, if they chose not to repent, their influence would be transferred somewhere else. Whew. Have you left your first love? Have you left your love, the first one? You individually? Your church? You might be really concerned about your church. You might be concerned about the church in general at large, the body of Christ. Well, you have reason to be in a sense, but remember Jesus' words. He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. It's his church. It's Jesus' church. And he's going to protect it. And he's going to rapture it. Now, what we need to do today, right now, what I want you to do is to join me. 
If you have sensed that you've left your love, the first love, or your church has left the first love, then I want you to pray. I want us to repent. We can repent privately wherever you're watching. We can repent publicly over the air because we don't want to leave our first love. We want Jesus to keep our candlestick where it is. Would you pray with me? Just, just repeat this after me. Just say, Jesus, you're the shepherd of my heart. I want to be like David. I want to be a man or a woman after your heart, God. And I repent if I have left my first love, my love, the first one. I repent to you first and ask you to forgive me. Don't take my candlestick. Don't take the candlestick of my church. Give us another chance. Give us another opportunity to fulfill your assignment and your calling to us. Don't take our candlestick. Let us keep our candlestick to be an influence in our city, state, nation, and world. And we pray with a humble heart, a heart after God, in Jesus' name. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, uh, would you just drop me an email or a letter and just say, I prayed that prayer with you and uh, I, I thank you for teaching this and I really want to uh, continue because, folks, we're not, we're not quitting. We're not giving up. <laughs> we're getting ready to go up, but we're not giving up. We're going to continue to do what God has called us. Even though VTN is not a church, we're a spiritual entity that God has raised up. We're your Arkansas Christian connection. Uh, we're a media. We're, we're ministering to the masses, not only in Arkansas, but all over the world through Roku, through live stream. So we want to encourage you. Yeah, we're going to keep our candlestick. We're going to repent and we're going to get back to our first love, our love, the first one. Join me again next time. Remember Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221. Or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection. And follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at happy underscore Caldwell. VTN is on Roku. Search VTN in the channel store and add us to your lineup. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at vtntv.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at vtntv.com.